At the time of this interview, the U.S. is working to get Americans and allies out of Afghanistan. The White House says it is surprised by how quickly the Afghan military fell to the Taliban. The White House predicted it would take months for the Taliban to take over. It took nearly days to talk about what this means for U.S. standing on the world stage, what options are left, and what this means for the people we could leave behind. I'm so happy to be joined by Robin Wright. Robin is a contributing writer and columnist for The New Yorker, former diplomatic correspondent for The Washington Post, and really has reported from all over the world, is considered a true expert on the Middle East, Islamic extremism, foreign policy, Robin, thank you so much for your time today. Great to be with you, Jessica. I just want to start on a personal note, if you don't mind. Um, we're looking at these pictures of chaos and panicked exit from Afghanistan. Um, there was always the possibility we would leave and it would be difficult, but did you ever imagine you'd see this? I was in Afghanistan in March. I've been going there for more than two decades. And I have to admit, I'm staggered by the speed with which the Taliban has moved across the country. In March, it held about 50% of the territory, according to the NATO commander whom I interviewed. And to think that they have taken the other half so quickly, most of it, just over the last 10 days. Uh, this is staggering in terms of the military dynamics, the political repercussions, and the impact for the United States. When you think that the United States is the might, mightiest country, or most powerful country in the world. Uh, it had warplanes and missiles, it even has a nuclear weapon, and it was fighting a ragtag militia that had vintage equipment, uh, but it had more will and endurance than the 300,000 Afghans that the United States trained at a cost of $83 billion. The dynamics of this, I think, will haunt the United States for decades to come. I think this is a turning point in American history, and uh, it has yet to play out, both in terms of the human cost, the financial cost, and I think the cost to America's image worldwide. Well, let's get into each of those um, things. First of all, do you view this failure as an intelligence failure, uh, an execution failure, or maybe a president who was deaf to warnings that this was inevitable if we exited so rapidly. You can look at all four presidents during our two decade intervention in Afghanistan and lay the blame at their feet for some serious miscalculation. Uh, there's an argument now about whether Bush should have pulled out after a year or even after months, given that it had forced the Taliban um, to the underground and forced the Taliban to take a stand against Al Qaeda. Uh, and you can look at it as an intelligence failure that, that for all that was visible to the human eye, that our many intelligence outlets didn't understand what was happening. After all, the same thing happened in Iraq. Um, and, and in terms of, um, the military, this is, again, we repeatedly, as a nation, our military leaders said the Afghan army was making significant pro progress. In 2013, General Milley, who is today the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, said that every day, every day, the Afghan army and the police force were making headway in fighting um, the Taliban. And you look at what happened this week, the Afghan army faded away and it is four times larger, at least, than the Taliban militia. That seems to be a failure of our training the Afghan military and also a failure of imagination or understanding of their willingness to stand and fight. I wonder um, how you assess the impact of the peace agreement um, the Trump administration made on sort of demoralizing forces there and whether Afghans felt undercut by the US and once that treaty was in place or that agreement was in place, was this kind of exit inevitable or not? Well, I think the issue is less the type of training that the United States provided and more the sense of will. Did the Afghan army want to fight for President Ghani or for this or now previous Afghan government? It was uh, engaged in rampant corruption. 
uh, the president was arrogant and self-absorbed when it came to trying to broker a peace agreement with the Taliban. The talks have gone on now for about a year and there was no budging him uh, that he laid the groundwork in many ways for the failure um, and, the, and questions about did the Afghan soldiers want to put their lives on the line for this government? So I think there were a lot of different elements. I do believe that President Trump made a classic mistake by agreeing to uh, a US withdrawal before there was a deal between the Afghan government and the Taliban. This took away any incentive the Taliban ha had to make a deal. They could just sit it out and play the long game, which of course is exactly what they did. Knowing that the United States was going to leave, it waited until the eve of that final withdrawal and then took over the whole country. The president's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, said today that Biden really had two choices. Either they, the U.S. could stay and participate in an Afghan civil war, which he said would have required more troops, or leave. And they did made the assessment they didn't want to dedicate more American blood and treasure to a civil war in that country. Do you agree those were the only two options? I think there were a lot of options. I think the United States could have stayed with a token force as it has in Iraq and been the kind of psychological prop to the government until there was a, a, some kind of agreement uh, in Doha where you know, they began talks in September last year. Uh, I think there were a number of options, both in terms of navigating the end game and politically or diplomatically, and then planning militarily for how it would happen. Uh, just five weeks ago, the president said the Taliban was not going to take over Based on intelligence assessments, the uh, US believed that the government could hold out 30, 60, 90 days. And in the end, it, it held out a week. Um, and the president fled without telling many of his members of his own government. So uh, again, I think everybody can share the blame who, who takes the biggest part. Um, I think it's kind of the Afghans themselves, but we did a terrible job in navigating navigating it, and that played in partly into our own politics, our own divisions. And if only we could speak as one nation when it came to the United States dealing with the world. The situation on the ground right now is precarious. We are doing uh, evacuations in a city and in a country that's under Taliban control. Um, Jake Sullivan, the security, national security advisor says the US will stay to evacuate US persons and our allies. But is it certain how long we can stay and at what risk? I think the United States intention is to get out by August 31st, which was the original deadline, uh, if it can expedite the withdrawal, both of American diplomats and American citizens, uh, plus a very large number of Afghans who were pivotal uh, in helping us as translators and as local staff, then they, I think they will do it as fast as they can. The problem is there are logistical complications. The airport has been flooded by Afghans trying to get out, clinging to planes. Seven died um, uh, today in try holding on to planes as they took off and then dropping to their death. Uh, the Taliban actually is on the outskirts of the embassy, I mean, the airport providing kind of a, the last checkpoint. It doesn't want people to come back from the airport in the United States. You know, the, the, the airport just can't hold all these people. So this is a, a, a an even greater tragedy playing out in this uh, end game that will make the United States look in some ways not as well disciplined or thoughtful in its execution as the Soviet withdrawal in February 1989, when the last Soviet troops walked across Friendship Bridge into Uzbekistan, which was then part of the Soviet Union. That was an orderly exit. Um, both countries come away as losers, tails between their legs, leaving behind chaos but the United States exit is even more chaotic. There's a wrenching interview in iNews today with a woman named Zarifa Ghaffari. She was the first female mayor in Afghanistan. She lives in Kabul and she's quoted saying, quote, there is no one to help me or my family. They will come for people like me and kill me. Would you paint a picture for us of the people who are reliant on us? They're not just translators. There are women, there are girls, there are female activists. And what could happen to them under Taliban rule if we don't stay and get them out? Well, I first went to Afghanistan in 1999 when the Taliban was in control. And I remember 
um, you know, the images are indelible in my mind of the kids who were begging on the streets because their mothers, the widowed mothers, uh, couldn't go out in public, or if they did, um, they had to have a male escort, and of course there was no one, no male in the family to, to go with them. Uh, the, the danger plays out on a lot of levels. It is just what freedom will women have to go out in public, to shop for their food for their families, uh, to engage in education, to have jobs. Uh, there's the question of whether the Taliban will, as it is said in the last uh, day or so, allow girls to continue to go to school, both to elementary school and to higher education. The question is what kind of education will it force girls to go back instead of learning their ABCs and their uh, two plus twos, will they be learning only from the Quran, only religious education? Uh, so, you know, the human tragedy, the, during the 20 years that the United States um, was a player in Afghanistan, 37% uh, of girls had learned to read. And that's something in a country. And the danger is, are we now going to go through years or decades when yet another generation is sequestered, cloistered, unable to engage with the outside world? And we go back to uh, what a style of life that is centuries old. Can you give us a sense of the scale of this? Is this thousands of people, tens of thousands of people that are reliant on us for safe exit? I think you, when you look at it, there will, I mean, the number banded around, and we may know more later after the briefings today, about 10,000 who uh, Afghans who have in some way engaged with the United States. But when you look at the number of Afghans who've engaged with the West, with the French, the Germans, the British, the Canadians, the Australians, the Japanese, a lot of Western countries, or worked with the NGOs, dozens if not hundreds of uh, United Nations agencies, you know, the NGOs who went in to try to help build civil society, uh, to help with educational and development projects. We're probably talking about tens of, uh, of tens and tens and tens of thousands of Afghans who played a role. And it's not just those males or females in the family, it is their whole families who may be endangered. Uh, in some cases, some of the male interpreters have already gotten out, but they have left their wives and children behind. So there is a lot at stake for, for a significant percentage of the Afghan population. You raise a prospect that this marks what you call the end of the American era. In your most recent piece, you call this exit an epic defeat and a bookend for the era of US global power. We remained a global power after the fall of Saigon or after Marines exited Beirut. Sometimes admitting failure and taking your losses is a sign of maturity. Why is this different from those events? And as you say, part of an unnerving American pattern. When you look at the 80 years of the American era since, the, since World War II, since the United States took on the sophisticated Nazi war machine or the formidable Japanese empire during World War II, we used our vast land, sea, and air power to defeat two regimes that engaged in um, warfare against Western interests. Today, we are, we were facing a period where this is kind of the culmination of a number of times that the United States has been forced to withdraw, not from mighty powers, but from ragtag militias. When you look at the US withdrawal from Iraq, um, the way ISIS moved in, and again, the Iraqi army, which had been trained by the United States, armed by the United States, simply faded away, fell apart, and ISIS grabbed a third of Iraq and a third of Syria. Well, we've seen a militia, uh, we, we trained again from scratch the Iraqi army and they've managed to come back, but they're still reliant on US air power, US intelligence, US training. We are at that point with Afghanistan, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, where you're talking about only 60,000 Taliban fighters in a country the size of Texas that, the fact that we were forced out or we opted out because it became clear that we weren't going to be able to win in a traditional sense or to prevail, um, whether it's diplomatically or militarily in this country, it shows the way America has been diminished. And I think with 
repercussions that will ripple across the globe. What country will want to pair up with us, be it for the kind of worldwide coalition that involved 132 countries to come together after the 9-11 attacks to uh, support military operations and humanitarian development in Afghanistan, or even in the kind of meager, cobbled together coalition of the willing that we organize to invade Iraq. Uh, the United States will be seen as an unreliable partner that doesn't follow through, doesn't know how to play the end game, doesn't know how to finish a mission. And I think this is going to have, um, will resonate for a very long time to come, sadly. You write that this will be widely perceived as the U.S. having lost the global war on terror. Do you think this moment is not just a blow to the U.S.'s image in the world or, or international relationships, but also a blow to global security and homeland security? Yes, on two levels. First of all, jihadism has won a key battle against democracy. And this is at a, at a time as we're about to celebrate two decades after the 20th anniversary of 9-11, that we thought we had done very well by ending the Islamic State Caliphate in Syria and Iraq. The reality is there are still 16 to 18,000 ISIS fighters in Iraq and Syria. Now you see the Taliban taking over Afghanistan. So jihadism ha has spread throughout the globe to the six inhabited continents. Just last month, the United States sanctioned another ISIS franchise that is in Mozambique, uh, a, a former Portuguese colony in Southern Africa where the majority, 60% of the population is Christian, uh, that the phenomena is far from over. And, and I think the, the idea that we can take on an ideology that has strong local support is also kind of a myth. The, we, we are so well-equipped militarily, our, the size of our military, the, um, all the things, all the tools we have didn't work. Our tactics didn't work in trying to take on uh, an extremist ideology. And I think the danger, real danger is that once the Taliban is in power, we will see whether it's Al-Qaeda or other like-minded militants returning to Afghanistan, where they will look for either a safe haven or a sponsor. What options does the U.S. have now? Not many. And this is where, whether it's trying to revive our reputation, prove our credibility, um, deal with the aftermath, it's very hard to see how we recoup. We will have very limited capabilities, whether it's intelligence to know what's happening on the ground. Uh, limited means of helping our allies who still are stuck in Afghanistan um, to deal with the, the cost of what happens uh, to a society uh, and to all those Afghans who are fleeing, uh, who's going to take them in, where are they going to live, who will employ them, uh, who will pay for them. And one of the things that I think people forget is that our presence in Afghanistan may end it will be what I think many Americans will look as a trillion dollar throwaway, but that's not the end of it. The estimates are that the United States will pay another $2 trillion just for the medical care and disability for all those who are injured, maimed, who've suffered even PTSD from both the Afghan and Iraq wars. And that expenditure may not peak until the year 2048. So America's longest war is far from over it will last and linger a very long time to come. Robin, I think of this team inside the White House as um, foreign policy experts. So many of the people that President Biden has put in place are not big name celebrity politicians or, or activists. They are people who've worked for decades in these fields and they talked about putting heart into foreign policy, thinking about the human cost as they make these decisions. What went wrong? Well, first of all, we have a disconnect. President Tr Trump was the one who said that, who de declared that the United States was going to pull out of Afghanistan. And that was set in motion before Joe Biden was sworn in uh, in January. 
he then had to set a timetable. Uh, both presidents, as I said earlier, all four presidents since uh, 2001, I think have made mistakes, will bear some of the brunt of the blame um, as history will eventually write it. Uh, but the, the gap to end the presence, the US presence in Afghanistan was I think miscalculated by uh, President Trump first and foremost, because he didn't allow the United States to stay until there was a deal between the Taliban and the Afghan government. And that left Joe Biden uh, basically to determine the date but Biden didn't have to accept the terms of that agreement. I mean, the Taliban, you could argue, was in breach, and he could have said, I'm not honoring this, or continued negotiations. Wasn't that an option? Well, the Taliban wasn't in breach. The talks were still going on. And the fact was, U.S. troops were already being, remember, our numbers were already way, way down. And uh, I do think that Biden could have said in the end, yes, we, could, we can leave this token force here until there is a deal. I think it would have been there a long time. But uh, we do have troops still in Germany and Japan all these uh, decades, more than a half century after the end of World War II. So that certainly was an option. We could have been a psychological prop. Uh, the, the, the American population had signaled any number of times in any number of polls that it wanted out of Afghanistan. Um, if Biden had stayed, I don't think there would have been huge cries for the withdrawal. I'm not sure it would have been an election issue next year. I think now it probably will be because the way we did it was um, was so chaotic, so tragic, uh, and so you know numbing, numbing. We're essentially at the 20th anniversary of 9/11. Um, we're going to see Afghanistan ruled by the Taliban, likely with the Taliban flag flying over the U.S. embassy. There, um, would you speak to? what that means symbolically for the U.S. and how to make sense of the loss, the amount of blood and treasure we've dedicated to this country and 20 years later to see the Taliban in charge <clears throat> again. Yes, and the question I think many Americans will ask, it, was it all for naught? Uh, 2,400, or, sorry, 2,400 American lives were lost, uh, 4,000 uh, close to 4,000 U.S. contractors, more than 40, I think it's 47,000 um, civilians, uh, Afghan civilians died. In total, about a quarter of a million people died during the 20-year conflict. Uh, the human cost has been horrendous. Uh, and, you know, will everything now unravel? Will the independent media die? Will there be no, there almost certainly won't be another democratic election. And one of the successes was we saw democratic elections more than once, and we saw the transfer of power from one president to another. Um, will uh, the lives of women go back to the dark age? Uh, almost certainly the Taliban will institute or reinstitute Sharia law as the law of the land. And does that mean stonings of people suspected of adultery or cutting off limbs? This is, again, what we in the West think of as barbaric practices. Uh, so, you know, again, how does, how, it, it, there are almost endless ways to think about what this means and, and what it does for that country, for the entire region. Uh, there will be, you know, refugees still after the U.S. finally pulls out its people and its allies, there will be still refugees fleeing to neighboring countries. Uh, trying to get into the West, um, there'll be a human extraordinary humanitarian burden. Uh, within Afghanistan, more than a quarter of a million have been displaced this year alone, according to the United Nations. Uh, you know, what happens to the economy? Um, what happens to all that aid that propped up so many elements, so many uh, sectors of Afghan society? I think close to 90% of the economy had had some relation to the kind of foreign aid going into Afghanistan and all that's likely to disappear at what cost? At what cost? Well, I encourage everybody to read Robin's work. I'll post some of it up into the gallery. Robin Wright, thank you so much for your perspective and for your time. Thank you, Jessica. Always great to be with you.